The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody in the hearing room and who uh, might be following the proceedings uh, on the webcast. Uh, this is the final day of the hearing which has been investigating the provision of health care and health services for people with cognitive disability. Uh, we uh, commence today by acknowledging and paying our respects to the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are meeting today, the Wongal people. We also pay our respects uh, to First Nations elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any First Nations people who are present today. Uh, yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning to everyone in the room and those following the broadcast. This is our final day of public hearing for this Royal Commission and we'll make some closing remarks at the end of the evidence today. For those watching, we certainly encourage anybody who also wishes to share their experience to do so with the Royal Commission and we'll talk at the end of the day about the manner in which that could be done. So, Commissioners, uh, our first witness today is going, to, and you'll see she's here, she's going to give some evidence about a topic which is sensitive and extremely difficult. Uh, we are very grateful for her presence today and her willingness to talk about matters that have had a profound impact on her and her family. Some aspects of the evidence today will involve talking about suicide and suicide attempts. It will need to be done in a sensitive and appropriate way. We'll endeavour to do this. We're also uh, wishing to alert anyone who may feel that hearing this evidence is distressing to perhaps take the opportunity to take a break from listening to the evidence during the course of the morning and I'm about to put up some telephone numbers on the screen. Yes, thank you. So we have a, a number of telephone numbers and for those who may not be able to watch the broadcast but are listening in, there is the lifeline number and that telephone number is 131114. There is also the Kids Helpline, which is 1800 55 1800, and Blue Knot, which is 1800 421 468. The Commissioner's please. So we'll just ask that Miss Abby be sworn. You'll be taking the affirmation. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms Abbey, thank you very much for thank coming you. to the Commission, and thank you very much for your uh, statement, which of course we have read. Yes, Ms Eastman. So your name is Giuseppina Cinze Port. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. But everybody knows you as Joe Abbey. Mm -hmm. And when you say, mm-hmm, I might need you to say yes. yes. Okay. And, um, and for the purpose of giving your evidence today, I'll call you Miss Abby. Is that convenient? Perfect, thank you. You've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission. Yes, I have. And uh, you've read the statement. Yes, I have. And the statement is made on the 26th of February this year. Yes. And its contents are true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief. They are. Commissioners, you'll find a copy of the statement in the tender bundle part A behind tab 22. And so I don't forget if the statement could be accepted into the Commission's evidence and tendered and marked exhibit 4.7. Yes, thank you. So Ms Abbey, you've heard me say at the beginning that we're going to touch on some sensitive and difficult matters. So if at any stage you need a break, just let me know. Thank you. So you've come to talk about the experiences that you have had in accessing and receiving mental health care for one of your sons, mm -hmm. but also health care generally for both of your sons, and both sons live with autism, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, you've had some significant challenges along the way in terms of accessing appropriate care for your sons. Very much so. And that's what you want to talk about today. Yeah, that's it. 
So because we're talking about them, shall we start by <laughs> learning a little bit about them? <laughs> so you have three children. I do. Your eldest is Philip. Yes, Philip who's turning 16 and wants to get his driver's licence as soon as possible. Okay, so we'll come back to Philip in a moment. <laughs> There's Giovanni. Yes, and he's just turned 12. And your little daughter. Yes, right? Katerina, who's 10. Right. And uh, tell us a little bit about Philip. So he's just turned 16, is that right? Yes, he, um, he's about to turn 16, 16. in April. He uh, wants to get his driver's licence, which is terrifying. Um, yeah, he's amazing. His favourite thing to do at the moment is virtual reality on his Oculus Quest. Um, and yeah, he's very anxious to start school this year and he's just a beautiful, beautiful boy. He's a big fan of Elon Musk, isn't he? Very, yeah, oh, he just, he's on YouTube all the time just watching anything on cosmology or astrophysics and yeah, he's just, his brain's incredible. It's just fun to watch him learn. All right. Now, your other son, Giovanni. Yes. So he's just turned 12, is that right? Yes, he has. So, so we probably just need to make an amendment to paragraph 8 of the statement. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't do that before. <laughs> I think he was 11 when you, when you started to prepare uh, yes, the statement. Yes, he was. 12. <laughs> so he's very different to his brother, isn't he? So tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, he's more of an underactive version of autism um, in, in thought and in action. It's, he needs a lot, more, a lot more support to sort of, you know, do anything and be challenged. Um, he he likes his safe places and he, um, he very much loves online gaming, but in particular the element where he gets to speak to other people in a safe zone, that's sort of his way of having friendships. Right. And uh, Katerina, who's not the subject of this particular <laughs> uh, hearing today, but you describe her as very cute, but she <laughs> is the, uh, the youngest in the family. And you've got some perspectives on her experience as a, a sibling of two brothers who mm. live with autism. What did you want to tell the Royal Commission about her? Well, I suppose she's an accidental carer. I was really concerned at one stage when I was very focused on the boys, especially when Philip became sick, that it was damaging her. And I found this great research that really sort of laid my fears to rest that said that the siblings of kids with special needs are so compassionate and she was actually asked by my brother what she wants to be when she grows up and she said special needs teacher so um yeah she and I are very much are carers but I do make sure that she gets to carve her time out so that she has a life of her own because I think that's really important for siblings of kids with special needs right. and you parent um the three children as a single parent yes right? I do and you have support from your family yeah especially my mum and also support from your former husband yes yes yeah. So let's um, move to Giovanni. Mm -hmm. And you say in your statement, before you had children, you were aware of what autism was mm. um, and you knew people who had children with autism, but you didn't have any particular expertise or any special interest in autism. No, I mean, I found it fascinating because it was in the family and my friendship circles. Um, I don't think I thought it would happen to my family, but no one ever does. And so when Giovanni was a toddler, mm. you suspected that he might have autism, but you weren't too worried at that time until mm. people started to say to you, I think Giovanni might be on the spectrum. Mm. And so you uh, listened to these comments and you found that the reactions were negative Mm. And you were well, you were initially dismissive. You said, "Don't be silly." Um, not me. So what happened was, um, I strongly suspected he had autism from the age of eighteen months. I pretty much knew that he did. And when I would suggest it to doctors and teachers and members of the family, they would tell me that I was being silly. Mm. So um, especially when it came to you know our local GP and his preschool teachers when they would say to me no he's fine I thought I was just being paranoid but I really strongly felt that he did right, but you sort of took it upon yourself to say well I need to find out a little bit more and you say in your statement that you googled a lot <laughs> yes and a you lot of filled googling. out an online does your child have autism survey mm. were they helpful to you they were i mean some of them are silly but if you are careful where you go you can get some really good comprehensive ones and of course they all came back as yes um and i think i was just starting to 
build up my bravery when it came to saying to those people I'd asked, no, we've really got to do something about this because I had read that the earlier you get help, the easier their lives will be. And so initially you had a discussion with Giovanni's GP mm. and you asked the GP, do you think I should get him assessed for mm. autism? And the GP said, look, I think it's fine. Yeah, I kept hearing this word fine and... They would say things like, oh, no, he makes eye contact. He tells you he loves you, so he can't be on the spectrum. They just sort of have this idea of one form of autism, and I don't think they had the training or understanding to know just how subtle and different it can be. And the thing that was really annoying was that they weren't taking me seriously. Um, I was concerned, so I wish they'd just said, well, you're concerned, so let's investigate this. And so when he was still young, you did turn your mind to whether or not you would need to take him to a paediatrician, mm. but the cost of having a private paediatric assessment was an impediment, is that right? Very much so. We'd um, suffered bankruptcy in the financial crisis um, and, you know, we had two, almost three children at that stage and the area in which I lived, um, if you can find... This, I could not find a paediatrician who would bulk bill. Um, and they were all like, you know, two to three hundred dollars for an initial consultation, which was our grocery money for the week, if not more. So someone might say to you, well, why didn't you go to the public system? Because the waiting lists are crazy and they're so far away. And, you know, we were trying to work and raise the kids. And I suppose I just kept, I mean, it's not that I was trying to avoid it or delay it. I know it was urgent, but there's just, there's only so much that you can cope with in a day. I was still trying to care for Giovanni and for Philip and, you know, be a, be a mum and work. So the convenience factor of healthcare, the affordability, it's all so important because, you know, easy access means having it be close by and affordable without a three month waiting list. And I just couldn't find it. So Giovanni started kindergarten, started school mm. in 2014, yeah. and you say in your statement everything went wrong. Exactly. He and just didn't cope. So he was becoming quieter and more insular at, at, when he was at school, mm. and you felt that the teachers were not recognising signs of autism. So at this point you hadn't got any diagnosis, but mm. you in in your own sense had a sense that he must this must be it. Yeah. And uh, one of the teachers did raise with you whether he had special needs and thought that he might have a hearing impairment. Is that right? She didn't think he was special needs. Mm -hmm. I had asked her because she was the special needs teacher at the school. I said, oh, I just think he might be on the spectrum. Like, should we investigate this? And she said, oh, no, you know, I think he is hearing impaired. I'm like, why do you say that? And she said, well, we did an exercise in, you know, the special needs class um, where she said, everyone close their eyes and tell me what they can hear. And when she asked him, he said nothing. So she suggested I get something called an audiogram. And so we and went... And you did that? Yes. And the hearing was fine? $90 and it was fine. Right. Um, and even after that, she didn't take seriously my suggestion that he might have autism and I suppose looking back I didn't really need anybody's support but these were teachers and doctors they know more than me or that that is at least how I felt at the time. So he managed to just hang in there uh, throughout kindergarten mm. and you eventually did get an assessment in mm. 2015 so he was about seven years old at this time. Yeah he was. And you set out in your statement about the process of obtaining an assessment and the assessment came through seeing a psychologist, is that right? Yes, so I just, um, we saved the money up to have it done as soon as we could in 2015 um, without, a re I can't remember if I had a referral, if I got a referral discount or not, but it was still over $2,000 to have it done and time off work and time out of school. Um, yeah, and then we got the assessment. And were you actively involved in the assessment process? Yeah, the, the assessment process is really intensive. It involves teachers and parents and carers, me in particular, Giovanni, um, it takes a few days and then a few weeks for them to come up with a report that will let you know what's going on. And so I think it's the case that uh, you were told the report was ready, but you had to pay oh. for the report, and that was a little mm. bit of a stressful situation. But yeah. you eventually got the report, is I that right? I did eventually. It was and, a painful process, though. And you had a, 
and it received by email. Mm. What, you had a quick read of the report in the car or on the phone. Yeah, I was just flicking through because I just wanted to see what the answer was. And it was on the very last page or one of the last pages. And you saw that the answer was a diagnosis of autism. Mm. And the report was quite long. Mm -hmm. And once you got that confirmation, you just put the report to aside for a few months yep. because you just felt you needed to process that diagnosis before you then turned your mind to what are we going to do? Is yeah, that right? yeah. Because it was just so painful. No one had listened or believed me and I didn't want to say I told you so. I just felt so misunderstood and just sort of so sad for my son. You know, an autism diagnosis isn't the end of the world. I just wish that one person had said, just get an assessment. Um, so having the assessment was amazing. I wish I'd done it earlier. So uh, you then had to uh, turn your mind to what would be appropriate form of treatment and management for Giovanni mm. in relation to his autism. Mm. And again, you deal with this in your statement, so mm -hmm. this is paragraph 30 and following. Mm -hmm. So you immediately informed his school about the results and did you talk to the school about what might happen? I think you say in your statement you kept thinking that the autism fairies at the school would fly <laughs> in and fix everything for mm. him, but that didn't happen. So, as you know, the focus of this hearing is on health and access yes. to health care, but you wanted to say something briefly about your experience in telling the school about the health diagnosis. So what, again, we'll be brief on this topic, but what would you like to tell the Royal Commission about how the school responded when you told the mm. school, the relevant teachers and I assume the principal about the diagnosis, mm. what happened? They didn't have any procedures in place and I was told on the special needs Facebook groups I'd joined to get the diagnosis, give it to them, they'd be able to access some funding, uh, Giovanni could access the school psychologist, um, someone who could specialise in teaching him. None of that happened. I think I thought the diagnosis would be sort of the turning point for Giovanni, but it, aside from just affirming what I'd known for years, it didn't make anything easier at all on us. And in terms of then the health side of things, mm. you thought that a paediatrician and or the psychologist would help you coordinate what the options might be for managing. Is that right? And that, yeah. uh, that didn't really happen to your satisfaction, is that right? No, because the diagnosis I received just had this long list of suggestions for what I do for Giovanni, and it was probably 15 or 16. I'd never heard of an occupational therapist before. Um, speech pathology, uh, psychology for anxiety, all these things, and it was so overwhelming. And then when I started making phone calls to access the services, um, there's waiting lists or they're not near to your home or they cost hundreds of dollars. And I just didn't even know where to begin. Mm. Um, so turn to Facebook once again and they suggested, you know, occupational therapy, but make sure it's a good one. Um, but you in my head, I'm like- You tried speech therapy, didn't you? Uh, we did a bit of speech therapy, but it's all just hundreds of dollars and you don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And for Giovanni to even, benefit from it, he has to trust the person. So you can't just get any available person who's affordable to do it. It has to be this amazing person you trust with your child, who he trusts, who you can afford, who doesn't have a three month waiting list, who can start working with your child. Right. And so for him, in terms of attending school, while you were trying to explore different options to support him, mm. school became quite difficult for him. And you took him out of the what you describe in the statement as the mainstream school? Mainstream right? schooling, yeah. We were right. with the Catholic system. I'd heard public was better, but that's where we were. But I realised through starting to work with an occupational therapist, he might need a more focused and intensive setting when it comes to education. And so uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about some of the other healthcare experiences that mm. you've had with him, but just bring us up to date in terms of Giovanni now. How is he travelling now and what's the situation in terms of school and his, um, and his opportunities at school? He's not in a school at the moment. Um, he was at an excellent school last year. They just loved him. He loved them. It was a public school, but they didn't have uh, specialists when it come, came to autism and our attempts to get funding for him all failed, even after we got his anxiety diagnosis. So we applied to go to a support unit. Um, we got a place locally. He lasted one day. 
He told me he had been uh, manhandled by a couple of people there and he was very upset. Uh, so I pulled him out and we're on the waiting list now for another support unit or I might do some distance for a little while until we figure out what to do. Okay. Now you wanted to talk about some of the experiences in for Giovanni accessing healthcare generally. Mm. So these are some of the matters that start at paragraph 40 of your statement. So when you go to the GP for anything with Giovanni, you, you say to the doctors, Giovanni has autism, so you're going to have to explain everything <laughs> as you're doing it yeah. so that he understands what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so you feel that you are almost like his intermediary, is that right? That you have to explain to the person giving him the health service, this is what his condition is, mm. this is how you'll need to speak to him. Mm. How have you learnt to do that? Uh, just through trial and error. I mean, I don't mind that someone doesn't automatically recognise that he has autism, but as soon as I say it, they're either brilliant or they've just got no understanding of how to communicate with him. And it makes you so grateful when you find somebody who communicates with him properly. Um, but I just wish that it was always consistent for him because in my head and the head of all special needs parents isn't what's happening now that I'm in control of his life. It's like in 15 years time when he's an adult and goes to the doctor, will they talk to him, listen to him, communicate with him properly? Mm. I mean, I can be the Giovanni whisperer now, but when he's older, he needs to be listened to and heard. So I just wish that everybody was up to speed on how to communicate because he's fascinated with the doctor. He's fascinated with the processes. Just because he's not looking at the doctor doesn't mean he isn't listening. Um, but yeah, we, we, he had to get an X-ray on his toe um, recently. And I said to the sonographer, I said, oh, he's, he has autism. So just explain everything as you go. And she did, and he loved it. He was so fascinated by it. Um, yeah, it's just so hit and miss. And as I said, I just want his experiences in the future to be consistent. All right. Anything else you want to say uh, about your experience in accessing healthcare, both through mainstream medicine, but all of the allied health services mm. that you've used that you want to say to the Royal Commission? And then we'll, we'll start with Philip. Yeah. Um, oh, with Philip? No, we'll start with Philip in a moment. Oh, okay, I just want sorry. to make sure that I've covered um, everything that for Giovanni. wanted to, to mm. talk to the Royal Commission about. Yeah, I think I just want to say that, you know, when you've got special needs children, it's life is so hard, like every day is hard, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what he'll eat for breakfast is hard. It's so limited, his anxiety, his, you know, anything else that's going on. So you're already very busy and then you have occupational therapy, other children. So when you go to find help for your child and it's hard to access or you can't afford it or it's an hour's drive away or there's a three month waiting list, it feels impossible. And you just feel like, you just, I'm just trying to raise my child so we can have access to healthcare and education and a life. And I just feel like there's, it's just so hard. It's really, really, really hard. And I'm worried about his future because I can fight for him now when, you know, when I can, but yeah, I, I don't know how he's going to fight for that when I'm no longer here. Can we turn to Philip? Yes. You're okay for that? <laughs> yes. Right. And you've got yeah. a picture in front of you. Yeah. And that's going to help you talk about Philip. Mm. And at some point in time, you're going to tell me if you want to share that vote. That I'm happy that to share got. that. Yeah, he's quite proud of that. <laughs> um, Art is sort of his therapy. Let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. what happened with Philip before we put okay. the picture up. Mm. So he's your first child. Yes. And while all of these things are happening with Giovanni, mm. it didn't occur to you to suspect that he might also have autism. Is Not that right? for a second did I suspect he had autism. I was so shocked when it was suggested to me by one of his psychiatrists in hospital. I was like, what? But then when I thought about it, it just started to make sense. Okay. And the way in which you came to Philip's diagnosis of autism was very different to Giovanni. Oh, yeah. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah, now. the worst ever. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Philip went to a mainstream primary school, mm. is that right? Mm. And things were going really well for him until about year five. Mm. And you say that a little black cloud started to hover over him when he was in year five at school. Yeah, he just seemed so sad all the time. 
he just wasn't my little boy. He'd always been very close to me and he'd had separation anxiety and things like that, but he was my first. Um, but yeah, it just was different. I just sort of felt on alert. Now, you uh, asked him what was going on mm. and you thought in your family that we're going to deal with any potential mental health issues in exactly the same way you would deal with any physical health issues. Yeah, exactly. With no shame, no stigma. I needed him to talk to me. So for Philip, uh, you thought, look, he's not happy. I'm not comfortable with how he's travelling in mm. terms of, of this sadness over him. And you organised for him to see a psychologist in, when he was in year five, is that right? Yes. You wanted to be a proactive parent mm -hmm. and you were not going to be anti-anything mm -hmm. and you didn't want it to become a big problem, is that right? Yeah, true. I thought, as I'd learned with Giovanni, the earlier you organise intervention, the better. So I didn't want to make the same mistake I'd made with Giovanni by delaying it for years with Philip. So I thought, I'll just get him in, let's figure this out um, and hopefully we can, you know, get my happy little boy back. So you found a local psychologist mm -hmm. and you started some treatment and that mm. partly involves a psychologist seeing both you and Philip at the same time mm -hmm. on occasions, but on other occasions, just the psychologist and Philip alone. Is that right? Yes, correct. And on one occasion, the psychologist said to you, Philip is very dark. He's very sad. I don't know what's going on. And he's starting year six. And you were... That was me. Oh, was that you saying? Yeah, All I right, said so, that. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I said, said to her, I okay. said, because she, she was lovely, um, but she would focus very much on what he said the problem was. Um, he would always think it was because he wasn't on this sporting team or because this person left school. Um, but I said, no, there's something else going on. Like he's, you know, these are just problems that we fix. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I said to her, I said, please delve deeper. Let's try to figure out what's, what's going, going on. on. All right. And so Philip then moves into year six mm. and you try to talk to him a lot. Mm. And your sense was that year six was just a little bit boring for him and he said to you I just need high school to start I'm so bored at school and you thought well let's get through year six and high school would be a fresh start mm. and uh, that he started high school the following year everybody was quite hopeful you were looking forward to it. He was very excited about starting high school, wasn't he? He was, and so was I. We just thought that was the problem. We kept trying to figure out what the problem was. We'd try to solve the problem, but then, you know, it would land on something else and that would be the problem. And I think Philip and I both realised, I think, when he went to Year 7 and he just became sicker than ever, that it was a bigger issue than just school, high school, friendship groups, mm. that there was something else something going on. Something else going on. I think you say that your sister uh, took mm. Philip and uh, your niece. My niece, right? yeah. They were going to the same school and she mm -hmm. took a photo of them on, on the, the first, first day. day of school and then sent that to you. Mm -hmm. But there was something about that photo that you say made your stomach drop. Yeah, he's he just... There was no joy in his face. It was like he was just stretching his mouth and I just could tell that he was having some sort of realisation about feeling bad that day and I just I just could tell that something was off. It was just his eyes were glassy. It was awful. I just, I really, really felt deeply that something was going on and we hadn't even started to figure it out yet. Mm. And I felt sort of more urgency that we had to figure it out because he was in high school now and he'd lost some of his friends and it was a huge life change. So I really wanted to figure out what was going on right, at that I'm stage. Have to ask you to slow. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> otherwise, I won't keep up with yeah. myself. Okay. So you've seen the psychologist for mm. almost two years, mm -hmm. and you said to the psychologist, "He's not my little boy. I've been coming here for almost two years, and you mm -hmm. keep telling me he's fine. He's not. Please help me." Mm. And uh, after. Uh, you had that conversation. A psychologist had had a session just with Philip, is that right? Yeah. And then she asked, it was she, wasn't it? Beg your pardon? Was that, that psychologist was a woman, is that yes. right? Yes. Okay, sorry, yes. I'm just making sure I've got the order right. <laughs> uh, she asked to speak to you alone after mm. that session. So I'll just give everybody a warning at this point in time. 
The psychologist told you that Philip had told her that he had tried to take his own life. Mm -hmm. and you Several times. And you reacted exactly as you just did now. You mm -hmm. went, mm-hmm, and nodded. Yeah. And it just, you, yeah, made sense. In your heart, you say you knew something was going on. Yeah, and without going into the details of that, um, there was stuff going on at home and in his room that I couldn't figure out, mm -hmm. that he had a reasonable explanation for. And then when she told me what he told her, I sort of, I actually was, I, I realised how lucky I was that he was still here. Okay. Because I knew it. I knew something was going on and he got so close. And yeah, I, the fact he's still here, I'm so happy. After this first conversation, the response was mm. not to take him to hospital. Mm. It was not to seek immediate or acute psychiatric care. The advice was just watch. And mm. the psychologist said that she felt that he hadn't made a real mm. attempt. It was a cry for help. Whatever that is, <laughs> I mean. So, you, yeah. but you followed that advice, is mm. that right? Because she's and, the expert. What do I know? <laughs> and uh, Philip continued to be under the psychologist's care. Mm. But um, some time after, uh, and I, is it fair to say, Ms. Abby, that you were on sort of pretty close watch? Yeah, I think I was not, not in truth, subconsciously you, you on suicide watch. I feel looking back, I just was yeah he was never on his own ever um yeah we were just keeping a very careful eye on him right so then there's a another occasion mm. and on this occasion you said to philip get in the car and you drove to the children's hospital into the emergency room and you were in the triage you mm. spoke to the triage nurse and you told her what had happened and she organised for Philip to be seen urgently. So it was an immediate response. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was asked about whether he'd hurt himself, did he feel safe? And so that immediate uh, engagement with the triage nurse, you said, was amazing. Mm -hmm. But then you and Philip were left in a room for 12 hours waiting to see somebody, is that right? Yeah, at least. And then crazy. A, a psychiatrist uh, came to see you and asked lots of questions and you answered all of those questions. And you were, uh, you were asked whether or not you wanted Philip to be admitted to the hospital. And you said no, because you didn't know what that would mean. Well, his psychologist had suggested next time he tries to take his own life, um, to take him to the hospital to call his bluff. She said that he was doing it as an expression of some sort of dissatisfaction, but she didn't think that he was seriously trying to hurt himself. And so I went through those steps, um, still thinking that she probably was right. Um, we didn't, it was a very long wait. We didn't get admitted. We went home. I told her what had happened. Philip and I started talking more about it. Um, not to the extent we do today, but we were starting to come up with some language to discuss what was going on with him. But I still just thought that it would be okay. I'd done all the right things, found a psychologist, taken him to the hospital, was watching him carefully. Uh, and I had no idea how bad it was gonna get. So he wasn't admitted to uh, the hospital on that occasion, but the associate psychiatrist you describe here, but the psychiatrist who you saw at the hospital gave you a referral to mm. see a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes. And so that was the start of Philip then seeing one of the uh, staff psychiatrists at the hospital. So you had some sessions with the psychiatrist, is that right? We had one session with an off-site psychiatrist. Um, I'd gotten the referral and he um, took issue with the fact that Philip wasn't regularly attending school at that stage. Um, and he wasn't regularly attending school because I'd met with the school about Philip's emotional issues and asked for support and they didn't have a child psychologist at that point. So a couple of the teachers were left to manage us and they treated it like Philip had a behavioural issue. Um, and I later spoke to the organisation that runs that school and 
they said it's so unusual we didn't have a child psychologist at that time and I didn't feel Philip was safe there and I couldn't watch him there. He was a high school student. If he walked home, who would watch him? So he was home at that stage, very sick, very thin. Um, and yeah, still, I was hoping the psychiatrist would give me some tools to use to get him some real help, but he just seemed to just make out like I was a bad parent because I'd pulled Philip out of school for a little bit. Uh, things came to a very serious point in January 2018, and uh, you came home from work early, early. and you saw that Philip was asleep. Mm. He's 14 years old at this stage. Mm -hmm. And when you tried to rouse him, uh, he was very groggy and you immediately knew something was not right. Mm -hmm. So you took him immediately to the hospital. Uh -huh. And this was an occasion where he was then admitted into yes. the adolescent psychiatric ward, is that right? Yes, and without going into detail, I knew it was serious because there was remnants of stuff in his room that I've just picked up and stared at and my brain just wouldn't go there. And I was like, he's groggy, I'm holding this, he's groggy, I'm holding this. And yeah, that's the closest he's ever yeah. gotten. So that, that was a horrible, horrible day. So that resulted in an admission into hospital? Yes, well, he needed emergency treatment at first um, in the local kids emergency um, ward. Um, and yeah, that was when they suggested that they admit him. Right. and. I know that you've told me mm. that that experience is very traumatic, so mm. I'm not going to ask you to talk about that in your evidence this morning, right? Okay, I'm happy to though, because people don't realise how horrible it can right. be. If you, if you want to talk about that, yeah, but, but briefly, of but I know how traumatic it is, mm. and I'm conscious of how traumatic it is for Philip as well. Yeah, but do you want to say something briefly mm -hmm. about what your observation was yeah. about the nature of uh, Philip going into the adolescent psychiatric ward. Mm. And I think this is uh, his fear that led to this drawing, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so mm. just very briefly, what would you like to say? So we were, he was treated for what he'd done to himself. And then once he was out of the woods, a psychiatrist came and spoke to us about admitting him, and I'd never considered it before, but we felt, and I think Philip also understood that he wasn't safe at home, so it was necessary to keep him safe. Um, and then we were left to wait just for hours, because you have to wait for a bed to be available. And they just were saying ward, ward, so I didn't really understand what it would be like. And so Philip and I were just sort of lying down sleeping, and then they came and got us. And we start getting wheeled to this place. We have no idea what it's like. No one's told us what to expect. And we go sort of the lift down to the dungeon level. And then you, you go through these hallways. And Philip and I are just sort of looking at each other like, where are we going? And then these big doors with Dr. Seuss on it and a lock. <laughs> and then you go into the waiting area and they take off to everything off him that he can hurt himself with. I sign a bunch of forms. There was no support for me. Um, it was night time, so they just wanted to admit him. And then I was to go home and then come back the next day. So my child who's almost died, like is going to be on the other side of a locked ward. Like, you know, and I, I make this gesture because that's, you know, when, when he broke his arm, I was asleep next to him every day. You know, he was sicker than he'd ever been, closer to death than he'd ever been, and I was, he was being taken away from me. I wish I could have stayed with him. Uh, and, yeah, it was, it was awful. And the next day when I went back, after crying all night, I went back to see him, and he was on the other side of the glass, and we were just looking at each other and just holding our hands up to each other. I think that the system just sort of underestimates how much you need your person when you're that sick. And it was just the worst thing ever to be separated from him. So talking about that was just uh, being in an experience and in a situation where you've never been before. Yeah. Is what you've learnt from that is the importance of having the right supports, but also Any knowing support. knowing what's coming up next and what's <coughs> going to happen. So that's yeah. why you wanted to talk about I wish that. that they'd showed me around it beforehand right. and had proper conversations with us. Right. But as a result of this admission... Mm. 
and uh, some investigation in relation to Philip. Mm -hmm. Uh, the outcome was the diagnosis of autism, is that right? Yeah, the psychiatrist suggested um, at a meeting in the middle of the day, because the meetings were always in the middle of the day when I was meant to be at work, um, and if I ever said I'm at work that day, I don't think I can get there till a certain time, they made me feel like a terrible mother. But Philip's problems had been going on for years at that stage, you know, there's only so much time you can take off work, and so I did my best, and we're sitting there, and she said she felt he might have autism. I was like, no, he doesn't. I've got one with autism. He's nothing like that. And she's like, no, I think he does. So we got a referral for another department in the hospital to have that assessment done. Yeah, and that started to explain a bit about his mental illness and his fixation on death as a solution to every problem that would come up okay. and that spiral that would happen. So it was a really useful diagnosis to get for him. Now, one uh, consequence of that diagnosis was then you were introduced to a psychologist at the Prevention Early Intervention and Recovery service at yes, Parramatta. Yes, I'd never heard, I did not know they existed. And that has been a very important mm -hmm. resource to you and Philip. Yes. And Philip has been under the care of uh, an expert psychologist yes. in adolescent health, is that right? Yes, a very overworked, amazing expert in and child psychology. And she has been able to assist Philip over the past few years, is that right? And support me. All right. Yeah, she's amazing. All right, so I want to now deal with things this way. Since that first admission and the diagnosis mm. of autism, then you and Philip have worked very hard to ensure that you've had access to the right health care and right support. So mm -hmm. the psychologist is one part of it. But things have still been rocky, haven't they, from time to time? Mm -hmm. And over the past few years, Philip has had a number of admissions and some of them have been um, admissions that have, have gone quite well, but other admissions have also been a little bit tricky, particularly where there were some renovations, I think, to one of the wards, which resulted in him having to go to a different unit and then come back and forth. So Yeah, that was an interesting choice to renovate that, that ward. Right. So yeah. I, I may not, we may not go into that. Okay. But what, um, is this the time you want to put up the, yeah, put up. So Philip did a drawing for you, <laughs> mm. and when did he do this drawing? Oh, I can't remember. He does so many drawings, okay, and they're so always so and, stark. And you've got that drawing in front, in of, front you of me. Because you find that <laughs> very helpful for yourself. Yeah, so it's he and I in a bubble screaming, and no one can hear us. <laughs> and I remember when I saw it, I was so sad, but I was so happy that he put me in the bubble with him. So we're both sort of like fighting together. Yeah, so he does art as therapy. He's really cute. But we sort of feel like we're not heard. You know, when you're shuffled around different wards, you know, I do the right thing. He tries to hurt himself. I take him to the local emergency room. Um, then we wait for 12 to 16 hours to see someone. Um, he may or may not be admitted. None of the experience of admission have been good, aside from the autism suggestion. Uh, got to a point where he wouldn't even tell me he wasn't feeling safe anymore because he didn't want to go back to a certain place. So I had to promise he wouldn't, so he'd talk to me. So we manage it ourselves now. Right. And at one point, I think um, Philip wanted to come and talk to the Royal Commission himself. He did. And, uh, but he, you and he, and he in particular, have decided mm. that he was happy for you to speak for him. Happy's a strong word. He really Sorry. wanted to be here. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that I mean, he started with food allergies and, you know, we talk about that openly and Giovanni's autism a bit openly. And then with the mental illness diagnosis, suddenly everyone's like, oh, shh, you know, don't don't say anything. But I've said to Philip, because he already, when you have mental illness, you feel shame. You feel like it's your fault. What He, he would say to me, mum, why am I so sad? I've got a perfect life. And I'm like, this isn't you. I said, you have a chemical imbalance in your brain, which makes you feel sad. I said, you're not deciding to do this and everyone sort of acts as though they, they'd say was he bullied does he have a hobby and it's like he's got a great life he just has a chemical imbalance in his brain he has to take medication for it like a type 1 diabetic and that's how I choose to speak to him about it because the shame of it stopped him talking to me for years the shame of it almost killed him you know the stigma surrounding it 
So we, we discuss it openly like any other medical issue in our family, friendship circles, everywhere, because so many people are suffering from mental illness and they don't say it because of the shame and the stigma. And that's why the suicide rate is so high and I'm not going to let my son become part of that statistic. And part of that work is empowering him to tell his story, um, empowering me to share my experience of caring for him, or the people who email me, who are in my position, because we feel like we can't talk about it because it's so shameful. I mean, it, it started this whole conversation of us just going, this is what our kids are like, this is what they need, and we're all in the same fight. Okay. We're all fighting for the same thing. We want our kids to be healthy and happy and alive. And yeah, we just try to approach it as any other medical issue. All right. Can I now turn to the NDIS? <laughs> and, they try. <laughs> and uh, since you've had the diagnosis mm. for both Giovanni and Philip of autism, mm -hmm. then you have now accessed the NDIS to obtain some assistance and support. Yes. And one of the challenges in the NDIS is you found about finding a right service provider or a support worker Caseworker. who can uh, mm. walk with your respective sons mm. and provide them the support they need. Do you want to say something about that? And then I'm going to ask sure. you about all of your suggestions for change. Because I know that people have had positive experiences with the NDIS. Um, I haven't yet. <laughs> um, it sort of feels as though they haven't even Googled what autism is before I walk in the room. They haven't read our file. I'm always starting from scratch. You have to have three goals, three goals only, no more, no less of stuff you want to work with um, that they will fund. And I'm like, well, we've only got two that we need funding for. <laughs> is that okay? And it's not. And then they give you these amounts of money and it's, I tend to get money for stuff I don't need but not enough for what I do need. I actually said, I just need OT money for Giovanni for this year. And they're like, no, it needs to be three goals. So I you know, came up with some other stuff. And then as a result of not spending all that money, we got less the following year. Um, we've had about eight different case workers um, The latest person tried, she said, we'll do it over the phone for both boys at once. And that was the worst outcome I've gotten. And then even when you get the money, so I got a big lump sum of money for Philip to hire somebody to help me with him. I just wanted someone to accompany him when he does his activities or, you know, goes to the doctor or maybe gets a little job. Um, and even to access someone qualified to do that with the right training who stays, who Philip likes, has been virtually impossible. I haven't managed it yet. So I know what Philip needs. I've got money for it, but I can't get the person to do it. I mean, both of my boys have it in them to be employed, productive members of society, but they're not getting the education they need, they're not getting the care that they need, and I just can't see how they're going to get there without all of that stuff in place. I want everything for them, and for me it's just sort of like a matter of, you know, they deserve an education, they deserve good care, they deserve a great life, and I'm so sick of acting grateful for every kindness and you know experience of understanding you know you're so grateful because you're so misunderstood all the time and people don't listen to mums especially in healthcare um, that you forget hang on they're entitled to this they have a right to education they have a right to have things verbally explained to them they have a right to have a doctor who knows how to speak to them you know these are their basic rights I'm fighting for my kids basic rights and it's 2020 and I don't understand what's going on okay in uh, the impact and the suggestions for change, mm. you raise a number of issues. Yeah. But I just, I'm looking at paragraph 111, and you say here, kids with autism are often geniuses. Sometimes. <laughs> and the only reason your kids are disabled, in inverted commas, Oh, I hate say, that word. Yeah, mm -hmm. is because, society, because of the society we've set up around them. Yeah. And you say, the way my kids' brains work is extraordinary. Mm. If they got everything mm. they needed, they could achieve so much. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that often think different naturally. Yes. And we don't do anything to support that. And instead you say this, you say, instead, we do a lot, of, uh, a lot to make them fit in. Mm. And all the treatment is trying to fix our kids' 
not fix the world, the world. so they can be whoever they are. Yeah. So this is a very strong view you hold, isn't it, about mm. uh, a diagnosis of autism is not going to be something that should be looked at as fixing or mm. curing, mm -hmm. but it's about adapting and that the world around them should be able to have enough capacity to adapt, to be able to allow them to access the things that you've just talked about, education, exactly. employment and mm -hmm. the like. All right. Mm -hmm. What other uh, suggestions for change did you want to raise with the Royal Commission? Well, I remember when my kids were four and they're about to start school and you go and have like that physical check before you start school, vaccinations, this, this and this. In my fantasy world, every kid has a cognitive test as well. You pick up any issue that they have, whether it be dyslexia or autism or mental, mental illness, and then you just put things in place for them so that they can have a successful experience at school and a successful life. And that removes the stigma because there's parents who don't want to acknowledge that their children have autism and mental illness. Um, but that's not their right. You know, these kids need what they need because they exist and they are who they are. And with autism, or the actual autism is a, such an interesting cognitive condition. It's the, the comorbid issues like mental illness and ADHD that makes it quite problematic, which you can treat. Um, but if you get that mandatory screening and it's just like, this is your child, this is the little cute jigsaw puzzle they are, and this is what we're gonna do to make sure that they can have a, a wonderful uh, experience at school, uh, that would just be a dream. And the other uh, issue that you've raised is the need for support for parents and mm. information. So mm. at paragraph 115, you talk about the online groups of yeah. people with autism and their parents, mm -hmm. and that's taught you more than any other more health any professional, other. you say. Oh, for sure, 100%, and especially adults with autism, um, adults living with autism. I always say, I want to do this for one of my boys is it a good idea or a bad idea? And they're like, don't do it, or yay. And like, it's just, they're experts at who my boys are gonna become in the future. Right. And so you wanted to recognise that people through these communities, even mm. if they're online communities, have been a very important support structure for you and your family, is that right? I'd go as far as to say that I wouldn't be a functioning parent of two boys with special needs without them. We just rely on each other so much, even in the process of participating here. We've just been talking every day because this is just our life and we don't want it to be hard. We just want to, you know, raise our kids. I don't want to be a doctor or a psychologist or an OT anymore. I just want to be a mum and enjoy my kids. And we all just celebrate the smallest things. Like there's really funny posts. Like the other day I said, Giovanni ate a taco. And they're all like, yay, because the food issues when you have autism are massive. And it's taken about three years of discussions for him to even do that. And it's just, you know, it's normal life for me and for them. But yeah, there's no support. You know, you can hire a psychologist, but once again, that's time, that's money, that's someone who has room for you, that's someone who is local. I can't even access easy psychological care for myself, let alone all the things the kids need. All right, so I'm gonna ask you, just uh, in closing your evidence, <laughs> thank you very much for coming to give your evidence today, to just read the final three paragraphs of your statement. So that starts at <laughs> page 24, paragraph mm -hmm. 116, if you want to read okay. those final three paragraphs. Okay, so I have to be a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist and a nurse to both of my boys. There aren't enough good practitioners who are affordable and available to help me with my sons. I feel like their human rights are being violated every day. They exist. We live in a society where everyone who exists should get what they need, but they don't. I'm reminded all the time that there are kids with more severe autism and severe mental illness, but you can't compare hardship. Sometimes all I can see is that my boys have no hope of having a good life. And no matter what I do, I can't make that happen because no one's helping me. I'm an educated, media savvy woman of resources and my kids are still not okay. When I do get help, it's patchy. And so I don't have any trust. I don't trust the healthcare sector. I don't know if they're trained or not but I'm tired of trying to figure it out. I can't fix the world. I'm too busy just trying to raise my boys. All right. Ms Abby, thank you very much for giving evidence to the Royal Commission today and thank sharing you. a lot of very difficult and mm. distressing times mm. in your life. 
um, we're very much grateful that Thank you've you. given us the time. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Commissioners, that's the evidence of Miss Abbey. We would like to thank you too. Thank you. And apologise to you for the delays in giving your evidence. Thank you for being so patient with us and thank you for the care that you've taken in preparing the statement and giving your evidence, sharing your experiences and those of Philip and Giovanni. Mm. And also that really quite remarkable drawing. I know, isn't he cute? We might put that drawing up again it when is. we finish your evidence. Yeah. It's he's, an extraordinary drawing. He's just, yeah, he always draws his feelings. And if you can't tell me how he's feeling, I can see from what he's been drawing. But then when he's sick, he'll rip them all up. I once spent two hours taping them together. <laughs> but yeah, he's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. And um, commissioners, I'll just uh, remind everybody of those telephone numbers so mm -hmm. they can come back up on the screen. So there's the lifeline number, which is 131114. The kids helpline number, which is 1800 55 1800. And Blue Knot, which is 1800 421 468. Commissioners, if it's convenient, we might have a very early morning tea for 15 minutes or so, if that's convenient. It's certainly convenient. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you again. We'll return at uh, uh, just 11.15. Thank you. Commissioner. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission has resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastwood. Um, Commissioners, just before we take some evidence from our two witnesses who are coming up next, uh, we thought it might be helpful to say something about the approach that the Royal Commission wishes to take in hearings of this nature. The Royal Commission will endeavour always to take a trauma-informed approach and we will be guided by best practice and this includes best practice in relation to reporting of incidents of suicide or attempted suicide or suicide ideation. The Royal Commission acknowledges that these are very distressing topics and have to be handled carefully and sensitively. But at the same time, there will be occasions during the course of the Royal Commission's work that we need to deal with these issues. So some of the material that we have found helpful from the Royal Commission's perspective in a public discussion about suicide ideation, uh, we have collected, and we thought it may be helpful to just put some of those references up on the screen. These are all publicly available material. I think they're just coming up on the screen there. 
And uh, this may be helpful to some people who may be following our proceedings and they're all, as I said, uh, available online. Yes, thank you very much. So, Commissioners, uh, we started this hearing, and it may feel for some of us a very long time ago, but it was a relatively short period of time. And our first witness was Kylie Scott. And so we're joined by Kylie's mother, Evelyn Scott OAM today. And we concluded our evidence at the end of last week with Tara Elif. And we have Margot Elif, who was Tara's mum. And we thought that this would be an opportunity to hear from the mums, <coughs> but very strong <coughs> women who have been strong advocates for their daughters. And we reflected on the need to <coughs> Uh, talk, talk about advocacy and, uh, uh, and the impact on family. So we have invited, uh, is it all right if we do Margot and Evelyn, right. rather than the formalities? Yes. Uh, we've invited Margot and Evelyn. I'll just check that Commissioner Atkinson's okay. Yes, I'm fine. All right. <laughs> so we'll just deal, deal with the oaths and affirmations. I understand you're both taking the oath. Yes. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence. We very much appreciate it. Ms Eastman, we'll ask you some questions. Uh, Evelyn, can we start with you? Your name is Evelyn Scott, OAM. Yes. And you're a retired public servant, a volunteer and an advocate. Yes and you prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 11th of February this year. Yes. And uh, commissioners, a copy of the statement can be found in part A of the tender bundle behind tab 44. Yes. So a copy, uh, you've read the statement. Yes. And uh, the contents of the statement are true and correct. They are. So commissioners, perhaps if I uh, tender the statement now so I don't overlook that. If that could be received into the evidence of the Royal Commission and marked Exhibit 4.33. Yes. Margot, your name is Margot Elif. Yes. And you are a registered nurse, midwife and a child and uh, family health nurse. Yes. You have prepared a, a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 13th of February. Yes. And commissioners, a copy of uh, Margot's statement can be found in part A of the tender bundle behind tab 45. And you've read your statement and the contents are true and correct. I have. And commissioners, if I deal with the tender of uh, that statement and if that can be received into the evidence of the Royal Commission and marked exhibit 4.34. Yes, and uh, we do have both of those statements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I want, I want to start. Both your daughters have <coughs> given evidence. I'll just check Commissioner Atkinson's. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. I've just got a cough. Uh, <laughs> she might be fine. I'm not sure about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not a novel virus. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if Commissioner Atkinson could turn towards Commissioner Galvin. Oh, I, I think it's getting to that stage of the <laughs> proceeding. Um, Margot and Evelyn, both your daughters uh, <laughs> came and gave evidence last week and you both supported <clears throat> them to give evidence. Is that yes. right? Yes. But for both your daughters, it was very important that they gave their own evidence. Yes. And yes. neither of them wanted anybody to speak on their behalf or for them. Is that right? That's right. right. Yes. Mm. And so the capacity in which you're giving evidence is that you may speak about your daughters, but you're not speaking for them. Is That's that right? right? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> So there are a number of topics that uh, I thought might be helpful to uh, just draw together some of the themes that the Royal Commission has heard over the course of the past two weeks. And uh, I'll touch upon this in each of your statements, but I hope that we can open this up more as a discussion. Yep. So for both of you, uh, the birth of your daughters was not met with how wonderful this is, congratulations. For both of you, uh, Kylie's born in Melbourne yes. and Tara's born in Sydney. Yes, right. um, what was the initial response to the birth of your respective daughters? 
in, in my case, it was silence yeah. uh, and um, a delay in my husband being told. He was uh, very worried because he thought something must have happened to me. And in a funny way, he felt a sense of relief when he was told that I was okay uh, and that there was a suspicion that Kylie might have Down syndrome. Okay, Margot? Yes, I think uh, silence was uh, the giveaway for me. Um, Tara was my uh, fourth child, so um, you know I knew what happened in labour ward, and I'd been a midwife. So yeah, it was that you could have dropped a pin. It was so quiet. Um, I wasn't prepared to ask anything uh, at that point because I really didn't. I needed to have some time to get my head around whatever it was going. They were going to give me, but I, it was. Um, some hours before a paediatrician came and told us. And he did it in the perfect, um, he followed all the rules, he did it perfectly. He gave me uh, Tara, in, I sat with her in my arms, he was beside me, he did it absolutely perfectly. But the minute he said Down syndrome, I didn't hear another word he said. Why was that? You just, oh, it was absorbing that. It was just, I suppose the shock, the, I've always described it as walking into a brick wall. Mm -hmm and you're just dazed. Um, I didn't actually meet that paediatrician again for 20 years and I sat and had coffee with him one day and told him and he was, what could I have done better? And I went, nothing, you did it perfectly, mm. but I didn't want to hear it. And he hadn't realised that that part, that aspect of it. And um, Margot, I think you say in your statement that your first visit to a medical centre after Tara was born uh, you were asked by the doctor why you'd chosen to have Tara mm. and the doctor said to you, you should have terminated the pregnancy. Yes, um, Tara was probably two and a half months old. It's always a long weekend when you, you think, oh, this child needs to be seen. And it was a doctor I didn't know. And yeah, I was, I sat with her in my arms and when he said, you know, you shouldn't have had her, I just, shook my head and waited until he'd written the prescription and I left. I didn't say anything, I didn't argue with him, I just... It puts you back into that closed down state. Um, but I went home and cried. And uh, this is a... The, what the undercurrent of a question like that is an assumption that you knew, an assumption that you made a choice and an assumption that that choice may have been misguided. Yes. Um, and yeah. so for both of you, I think this stepping back uh, and asking what are the attitudes and what are the current issues in terms of uh, testing? So mm. in terms of prenatal testing, and this is something that you both have some very strong views about and you wanted to talk a little bit about that. I think some of the evidence that the, we've heard during the course of the Royal Commission is this assumption that A, you need to be tested, B, if you are tested, then you should do something about that. And that's uh, a topic we're interested in exploring because you have issues around choice, but you also here have issues around dignity and value of life. And whose assumption is it? And you may have heard from some of the evidence this sense that a doctor makes that choice rather than the uh, woman making a choice. So you want to both talk about that and I'll open it up to the two of you. Well, to me it's really important to understand that it's not just the doctors, it's the midwives. It's, you know, they, they do a lot of the work in antenatal clinics um, and there is the pressure to have the testing. There is absolutely no doubt about that and that you should when you get um, a high risk, which I find even the language offensive, that you will automatically terminate. I think the whole medical profession, health just does not understand. It does not matter what decision that woman or her family make. She lives with that for the rest of her life. She might terminate, but it's, it's not unusual for them to make a donation to Down syndrome New South Wales. It's not unusual for them to bring it up. Um, at subsequent health, you know, births, it comes back to them. And I've, I've cared for people in their 90s who still talk about their losses 
So an obstetric loss, which is what this is, even though it was a decision they might have made themselves, they don't forget it. Mm. And I think that's really important, that it needs, it's not just a case of, well, we've terminated this pregnancy, now you can have another one and get on with life. It's not like that for a woman. Mm. Evelyn, did you want to talk about this? Yes, if that's all right. I mean, I'm, ne I'm never going to criticise anyone who decides, you know, to mm. terminate. They have their own reasons. Uh, my big concern is that there is not sufficient information made available to people at the time of testing uh, so that they can go away with an informed uh, opinion about what's the best course for them and their family. Um, I mean, I just wanted to mention in Kylie's evidence on Tuesday last week, she said the big thing these days for doctors to know about is prenatal testing or prenatal screening. They need to know how serious it is now these days. I think we should continue people with Down syndrome not being aborted. Now, I mean, I've just got a few notes here, if you don't mind me reading them. Kylie's, you know, a black and white person in a lot of ways. Um, and it was her view, certainly on Tuesday, still probably last week, that there should not be any testing. We've talked about it since and um, uh, in her talks that she gives, um, she does touch on it, uh, you know, and she asks the question, how do you think I feel when I hear about mothers being told after testing that their baby's likely to have Down syndrome and that it can and even should be terminated? Um, in my, well, I mean, it's something that um, I really quite resent uh, the fact that it's me who really has to say to her um, things like, uh, never mind, you're alive, you're loved sometimes, but not always respected. Um, she's very aware of what happened in Hitler's death camps in World War II and that people with disability, particularly intellectual disability, were the first to be eliminated and what that led to. And she's able to see on Facebook discussions that are taking place, particularly in the UK at the moment, where fetus is likely to be allowed, or it can be aborted, or that there is discussion now around the fact that fetuses which are detected as perhaps having Down syndrome may be allowed to be aborted virtually up to birth. And she wonders how that can happen. How can people be so cruel? And she also knows that in some countries already there are no babies with Down syndrome being born. I mean, is it my role to say that if there's a diagnosis of Down syndrome in a pregnancy, that some parents feel, perhaps because they've never met someone with Down syndrome, that they could not cope with a child with a disability, so they've made the decision they shouldn't go ahead? And they perhaps for the rest of their lives might remember how it felt when they see examples of um, people like our daughters these days, they must wonder what their baby would have been like, what their baby might have been able to teach the world like our girls are trying to do. I really do resent the fact that it's up to me to justify these abortions to her, especially when we hear that Medicare's wanting to, or thinking about fully funding NIPT for all pregnant women. And, you know, in the expectation many of the detected pregnancies will be terminated. There are medical professionals who still look upon people like Kylie as just, as just not, I'm sorry, deficient intellectually, but medically different too because of their three copies of the 21st chromosome. They feel that the, you know, they are burdens on education, health and a range of other possible services. Should I be the one to explain to her that governments feel that they can make these decisions because there might be additional costs to be met from the public purse without looking at the costs I might incur, for example, if I'm bowled over by the little electric bus running around here and end up paralysed? Should I then be put down because of the burden and the cost? I hope not. Um, Anyway, yes, I feel strongly about it. So, um, 
So you're concerned that these still remain issues and that as a community we really haven't thought through these I don't issues. think the medical community is recognising the full extent of what they should be considering. Right. Now, Evelyn, after Kylie was born, a social worker showed you and your husband some outdated books with appalling photos of adults with Down syndrome and the social worker advised you not to take Kylie home and suggested that she could be adopted out and your uh, immediate reaction was that was not going to happen. Yes, that was correct. We decided that she was ours and therefore we would do as much we could for her as we would do for our older daughter. Now, at the time, your husband was working as a lecturer and came to know uh, Dr Graham Clooney's Ross. Yes. And as a result of that, you were able to get access to a number of resources yes. to help understand about what Kylie's development from infancy through to being a toddler and then, to, as far as you knew, into the future. So you were able to obtain some resources that would assist you to uh, help Kylie in terms of her low muscle tone, her fine motor skills, tongue retention, speech and the like. That's so great. that was very critical. Oh, it was because it was an exercise where not only were they working with Kylie, but I was able to learn, you know, some of the exercises and things that would enable her to perhaps progress her development more evenly. Mm -hmm in a more structured fashion. And Margot, you say that you had the support of a community nurse in a case management capacity, mm. and the community nurse helped you negotiate the entire health care system after Tara was born, and that continued until Tara was five. Yes, yes. And the community nurse was able to assist you in managing Tara's health care. Mm -hmm. and she was able to assist you to access relevant resources. But you say at the time the community nurse's qualification was called a retard certificate. Yes. All right. So um, did you want to say something about the role of a community nurse? And given your particular role and experience yeah. in nursing, what were the... Uh, what were the aspects of the way in which the community nurse both engaged with you and Tara, but also was able to help you navigate that made a difference? Because some might say, well, Margot's a nurse, she should know where to go and how to do all of this. Mm. I think the important thing was that um, her children actually went to school with my three boys. And um, so there was a community social conflict piece to it and, I, and I just, it made me feel as though I, it was just part of, I was part of this community. I wasn't isolated because I'd had a child with a disability and you know she'd see me and say oh I'll be around for coffee this week and we can have a chat. So it was a lot of the psychosocial aspect of her support that was really important for me. I didn't have any family as such um, either side of my husband's uh, family are overseas so it was that to be able to talk about stuff that perhaps you could talk to family if you had them there but to be able to talk about how I really felt and at the end of the day there was no judgment she let me waff on as long as I liked and have as many cups of coffee but she'd say now the list of things that we need to do hey, where are you along this and I go oh well I've tried to make an appointment but you know she said, no worries, I'll make that appointment for you. So she took some of the, the burden of making those appointments and can I help you get there? No, no, I'll be fine. She said, I can get you a parking ticket. Just little things like that that made it more accessible for me and that I didn't, because I had three other kids that I had to chase as well. And so just those little things, explaining, you know, perhaps we need to look at this. And I'd go, oh, why? And she'd say, oh, well, you know, she's got a little ear canal, so perhaps we just need to have, an, have a hearing checked again. Just little things that, yeah, I hadn't thought of. Do you know if there, there's still uh, a position of community nurse, as somebody who performs no. that function in the not in the system? No, not in the disability field, no. Mm. But I actually do part of that role um, in my job. Right. OK. Yeah. Now, both um, your daughters went to school and they both completed school. 
Yes. And Evelyn, I think you, in your statement, uh, detail quite a lot about Kylie's school and her background. Yes, yes. Uh, and how she went through school. And uh, both of them have gone on to find employment in different capacities. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, Kylie's had a variety of employment. Um, and because of uh, her father deciding that he needed to leave the marriage when Kylie turned 18, um, Kylie suffered a lot of depression and anxiety. Do you want me to speak about that now? Well, I want, so I want to just, because this hearing we're focusing on health, so I just wanted to make sure that we didn't omit something in terms of their education and the fact that, that you've both encouraged them and supported them to find employment and they've done that. But I want to really come back to some of the healthcare issues that have arisen along the way in terms of their general health. So I'm happy, Evelyn, if you want to talk about <coughs> one issue that's arisen for Kylie, which is her mental health and psychological well-being and being able to access resources to assist Kylie in those matters. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. And then we'll come and talk about GPs and other things. Yes, all right. Well, I mean, because of the suddenness of um, my former husband's decision, uh, Kylie and I um, had a pretty rough time of it. Um, Kylie just didn't know what was happening and it was very difficult for her. Um, she was going into year 12 at the time at, at college or high school and um, she had so much upset that there were times when she was cutting herself. Uh, many years later she told me, and I hadn't even thought of it, that it was to let the pain bleed out. On one occasion I got a call at work saying she was about to jump from a second floor balcony and um, it was a pretty bad year. Um, Kylie continued, you know, progressing through college, TAFE, um, and then into various jobs. Um, it wasn't always easy. I think her depressive problems were not assisting her in the <coughs> workplace. She worked at a supermarket for a while uh, and then one day I had a phone call, again at work, saying um, I had to get there now to see the manager. She was accused of putting her hand up a girl's skirt when the girl was on steps stacking shelves. We were told Kylie had the option of resigning or he'd call the police. I went outside with Kylie and suggested to her be best to resign as things would be made very difficult for her. She was shocked, upset and denied it and I believe her. And you know, her morale absolutely plunged. And then a couple of years later, she got an opportunity to uh, go into the public service on a part-time basis. She was really excited. It was fantastic. She loved dressing up, getting the bus. You know, people were kind. But the public service, for better or for worse, has a lot of staff changes and, you know, departmental restructures and no one was allocated, it seems, for a long time to um, take any uh, responsibility for organising her work. Back in those days, job agencies, job disability job support agencies had very little time that they could spend in a workplace. Uh, and often over the years, we came across support people in these agencies who had just graduated from university it was their stepping stone into the workplace, in, into the workforce. So um, they didn't really have a lot of experience, and particularly not in the public service. People were kind, but she wasn't getting structured support. There were times when people accused her of um, harassing them because uh, she'd ask if there was anything she could do. There were times when she was sat at a computer and facing a wall told to play computer games. So how did that have an impact on her oh, psychological I mean, she health? She was devastated. She'd come home and say, well, for a long time she didn't tell me a lot of these mm -hmm. problems, but it obviously didn't help her morale. You know, so she knew that wasn't what you should be doing when you go to work. And so what, um, 
resources, supports or assistance were available to assist Kylie in terms of her psychological wellbeing? Well, we went through a never-ending series of psychologists, um, even um, psychiatrists for a while. Um, they suggested medication. We tried that for a while, but it was not helping and she felt she was just, yeah, not herself. Uh, we had a lot of counsellors that we went to. We weren't getting through to the nub of what her problem was because she kept wanting to relive what had been happening to her. Uh, it certainly wasn't helping her. Uh, have you found that there are specialists who've got the experience in both intellectual disability and psychological services or psychiatric services? Well, I think there might have been one psychologist who had some experience, but um, they have a program which they work through and then you're pretty well left to go deal with it. Um, I don't think any of the experiences she had made a significant difference to her well-being. Can I ask you now about um, the general health care and if we sort of say primary health care, both of your daughters regularly see general practitioners. Yes. And Margot, uh, Tara talked about her GP in some detail last week. Yes. Um, so uh, we've got Tara's evidence, but you've set out in your statement your observations about the GP's engagement with Tara and the GP's management of Tara. Did you want to say something about your observations? Well, she's a very special person because she's got a... Um an interest in disability and she works a lot with boarding house uh, clients so she takes time and I think it's time and she listens. So if I do attend with Tara um, I always make sure that I sit behind um, the GP. Tara always sits beside her. The conversation is between Tara and the GP if I you know I find that very difficult sometimes not butting in but I manage and um, she we, we pre-organise what we're going to talk about and she you know she'll take a script along with her and say you know it's nearly finished so I need another one so she takes visuals to remind her she has a list of things um, and the GP if there's any decisions to make about what we might want to do medication we might want to trial um, we think about it, I research it, talk to Tara, she research it, we all get together and look at it again. And, you know, then Tara will go, well, you know, if you're both saying the same thing and, yep, yeah, let's give it a go. Um, so that's how we sort of work it. Um, sometimes I'm not there, I'm at work, so she will, um, I get the phone call from Tara. She puts it on the phone on speakerphone. Uh, and we'll talk it out together. So she's quite comfortable, you know, Leanne sends her off for um, you know, blood tests and all sorts of tests, and if she's been sent, she'll do it. Okay, and Evelyn, uh, Kylie sees a, a GP on a regular basis as well? Yes, we've had a few moves over the few years. Um, and, and, you know, from the very beginning, we've always made a point of going to a GP and interviewing them. Um, we came across one once who was not attuned at all to what we were on about. We didn't go back there. But generally, um, they're all willing to learn. Uh, and the most recent one that Kylie sees has been excellent. Every time we see her, she says, oh, I'm learning so much with you two. Um, and, you know, she is progressing a few things at the moment with Kylie, which have come up unexpectedly. Is the key to this aspect of primary health and the support of the GP that that the there is continuity of care, there's a consistency in the approach, and also that it seems from the evidence a, a real focus on preventative care, so anticipating issues that might arise for them as women, but also as people with intellectual disability, yes. is yes. that right? Yes, yeah. that'd be right. And I think that's shown very clearly with um, the GP's use of the care plan. And I suppose 
I was a little bit shocked to realise that most of Tara's friends actually don't have care plans, but it's a Medicare funded option. Um, she can have it renewed every, every year apparently. Um, and it's just all currently all her history, all her test results, and just little things like, you know, every two to three months we check her ears because she tends to, um, her hearing goes down, so we check her, check her ears. Um, we check her skin. We, you know, there's so many little things that she might not remember. Um, and if it's on the care plan, they pull out the care plan and go through it. And I just think that care plan's invaluable, but it seems to be a Medicare secret. Right. And you might recall I asked both of them when they gave their evidence about how they made decisions for mm. their health care and the issue of informed consent and how you support people with intellectual disability to make decisions themselves. And Justine O'Neill, who's here, spoke uh, with Jack Kelly at the commencement of the hearing about the importance of these issues. Uh, both your daughters gave some pretty clear evidence about the way in which they make decisions and they both said trust of their practitioner was important. So if they trusted their GP and uh, the GP suggested particular treatment or medication, then that's helping them make their decision. So from your perspective as their mothers, uh, can you ha can you talk about how they go about decision making, and how that sort of sits with this concept of informed consent? In my case, um, once uh, Kylie's father and I separated, uh, I knew very early on that Kylie needed to learn uh, decision making. She was very vulnerable at the age of eighteen, and there on up in terms of um, you know a lot of daily activities she'd come from a very supportive family situation and suddenly was sort of dropped into a very difficult life um, and decision making was something i became aware of very early i mean there were times when she was duped out of money and times when she'd go to the bank and even on one occasion when she was given the wrong money when she asked for a withdrawal uh, so decision making was crucial and um, she's always been taught by me that she must always, if she's uncertain, say I will think about that and I will talk to somebody so that I can get informed advice, I can look at options and then I can choose an option that would help me make the right decision. Um, it's been very valuable throughout her life and in recent years, uh, since we moved to Sydney 10, 11 years ago, Kylie's been accessing CID programs around decision making, about advocacy support and all the rest of it, and mm. it's been very valuable for her. Right. Margot, what's the approach that you've observed for Tara making decisions? She was quite confident when she gave evidence last week about how she went about making decisions. Yeah. Look, she usually talks over things, but not always. There are times when she just sips those lips and she makes her choices herself. And you've got to respect that. And if it falls over, well, just like all my kids, when they make choices that I didn't think were very good, um, you've got to support her. And then it's usually, how could we have done that better? But generally, she makes quite, quite good decisions. Uh, she talks about it. She goes. She might gather some information herself. Sometimes I do the the pros and cons with her. Use the visuals. Write it down, um, and that helps her make decisions. And like Kylie Tara goes to CID, and she's learnt lots about advocacy and decision making. And and I think that's a really important factor that. Um, people with intellectual disability need that ongoing support. We, yeah, we've taught her how to make decisions, but it doesn't mean she's going to do it in six months' time. She's going to do it the same way. Yeah. So it's the constant reinforcement mm -hmm. uh, that she needs to help her make those decisions. So, mm. 
And it's often helped by very visual things. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, if Kylie's got a a major decision like when she moved into independent living and when she then subsequently moved into the house she's now in, an affordable living apartment, we did plus and minus lists of, Mm -hmm. you know, what's the right thing here, what will work for you and what will not work for you and is it near transport, is it going to help you with your shopping? Will you be able to go to the shops independently? A whole list of things. So a lot of visual lists are very helpful. I think she gave some evidence about experimenting with the cayenne pepper. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, like that. So, you, you make mistakes. So um, <laughs> We all do that. <laughs> uh, so independent living has been a very significant step for Kylie, hasn't it? It has, And yes. so that's brought with it the challenges that she described about the cayenne pepper and cooking. Yeah, yeah. But overall, it's been a very uh, good outcome for Kylie to live independently. It has, because, you know, while she was so depressed for so long, she was getting independent living training when we moved to Sydney 11 years ago, uh, and that was really good. But, of course, uh, and and she had lived independently in Canberra some years ago, which was a bit disastrous in lots of ways. Um, But um, the um, independent living skills she was acquiring... Uh, were also frustrating her even more so because she wanted to do things for herself. She wanted her own home. She wanted to be able to do what she wanted to do and whatever. Uh, And, you know, it was pretty hard then to get the supports in that context that she specifically needed. And since the NDIS has come in, of course, the supports can be more tailored to suit exactly what her needs are. Um, And that is helping. Not all of the things are exactly meeting every need, but we've certainly gone a long way down that path. Now, Margot, uh, Tara gave evidence last week about a situation where she had an acute abdominal pain and you you went, uh, your husband took her to see a GP, not the usual GP, and the advice was that Tara's suggestion that the pain might be 6 out of 10 might actually be closer to 10 out of 10. Yes. And so the advice was to take her immediately to the local hospital for emergency treatment. And your husband took her to the hospital and you were contacted by phone at this stage, but you weren't involved in that immediate uh, triage exercise. But in your statement, you describe what happened at the hospital We heard Tara's evidence last week and the upshot of her evidence was that even though she knows you work in a hospital, this is not a place that she really wants to go. And as she was giving her evidence, she would talk about aspects of it and then she just jumped. Mm. And we didn't go into it in any detail. She didn't want to do that. But um, you wanted to talk to the Royal Commission about what actually happened on that occasion in terms of the hospital presentation. And this is very relevant to communication in an emergency setting, but also the importance of you to decide when and how you're going to step in and, uh, and in effect, you had to take over the situation. Is that right? Do you want to yeah. tell the Royal Commission what actually happened on that occasion? So I'd arrived um, probably after she'd been there for at least well, three quarters of an hour or more. And at this stage, she'd already seen multiple doctors. And I, I didn't see at any point, any doctor at any point actually physically examine her. It was always with the curtains open, the very busy A&E staff, patients everywhere. It was, it was quite um, busy. Um, Nobody closed the curtain. There was no privacy. It was um, reading the notes, the doctors reading the notes or asking her questions. And they just didn't seem to understand that she wasn't answering the questions. Um, She just was slowly, slowly withdrawing and shutting down. And, you know, Tara, I think Tara said, oh, mum can read me like a book. Well, it was pretty obvious to anybody, I thought, that um, she wasn't responding to them. So they'd done a lot of tests and everything, you know, 
the, the senior doctor finally arrived and said, OK, you've got gastro, I think you better go home. And if, I suppose the, for me, if I hadn't been there, she would have got up as best she could and gone home. Um, it was only then that I went, look, we really have to talk about this pain. And so I asked her to show me where her pain was and she tapped me on the shoulder. So if you have abdominal pain and it's referred to your shoulder, it's more than gastro, um, in my experience of years of working in A&E myself. And the doctor went, oh. And um, then he ordered another scan. Um, she at that time was still not saying anything. She was, she just was terribly, terribly uncomfortable with the pain, and had no pain relief at that time either. So um, she had an ultrasound, and I think the uh, sonographer was just magic. She explained everything to Tara before she did anything. She apologised for that this might hurt when I press on your tummy. She did, yeah, she was very good. She went off to speak to somebody else because she told Tara that um, there was something on the scan that she wasn't happy with and she needed to consult with. And then we went back to the ward, I went back to, um, to the A&E department and it was then that the doctor came along and read this, the report or looked at the scans and said, oh, well, I think we need to take her, admit, admit her to the ward and she'll probably have her operation tomorrow. Um, so the issue was not gastro, but no. a fairly infected and inflamed gallbladder, is that yes, right? Yes, that's Which right. is an extremely painful yes, condition. Yes, it is. And so she had to have some surgery, surgery, and that resulted in a hospital stay for about four days. Four is that days. Right? And your, it's a case, I think you stayed three out of the four nights and your husband stayed mm. one of the nights, but you didn't feel that Tara would be able to deal with that post-operative stay in the hospital alone? Why no. was that? Well, at no point could I have left her. She was, they either was, there was staff in a room all the time or there was nobody. Um, they didn't offer a pain relief um, and that's routine post-operative care is to give somebody pain relief. And she wasn't offered any, she had to ask for it or I had to ask for it. She was in a single room, the furthest from the, 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 the central desk. So she was a long way away. She felt very isolated um, and she had drips in her arms. She had um, infusions in her arms. She had lying there in the bed, not going to move. Um, and yeah, she depended on somebody being there. And you know, it's another thing that I think about. So what's gonna happen when I'm not here to be with her? Mm. Um, we have to change it so that she isn't going to be alone and frightened. Because fear is probably exacerbates the pain even more and um, we need to do something about it. Well, the way she talked about that when she gave her evidence last week and, and she just says, I don't like hospitals or I want to go to hospitals. So she didn't express it as a fear of hospitals, but just in a very sort of matter of fact way she doesn't like hospitals black and white she's very black and white yes um she, no she wouldn't say it was fear she mm. wouldn't identify that but she she won't even go and visit people in hospital because she'll get a she gets a flashback mm -hmm. it's and the, the idea of the pain that she couldn't get somebody to help her with unless you know I pushed it and said, she needs pain relief now. Um, not being in control. I mean, I think we all have problems with not being in control. So I want to turn now to uh, your roles and both of you have become very strong advocates and become very involved in associations such as the Down Syndrome Associations. And I wanted to ask you, what was it for each of you that really thought, I need to do more, I need to become an advocate, not only for my own child, but more generally for young people and people with Down syndrome? Why did you decide that you wanted to take on an advocacy role? I don't know who wants to go first. 
in my case, I don't think it was a deliberate decision. Um, when we moved, when Kylie was about 18 months from Melbourne to Canberra, um, we'd sort of asked friends there what the early intervention services were like and they very kindly just said, oh, they're great, you know, there's a centre there. But of course, when we got there, it was nothing like we had been receiving in Melbourne. So we were pretty disappointed and had to work pretty hard to get what we felt Kylie needed. And that even resulted because we um, were keen to have Kylie go into the mainstream school that her sister was at. Uh, in us, um, yeah, having to lobby to go to the meeting which decided where Kylie might end up at school. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we had to, you know, pull out the Human Rights Act and, you know, services for children with disability and all the rest of it. I think, Evelyn, um, you listened to some evidence given earlier this morning. I did. And um, you wanted to say something about uh, Ms look, Abby's I, I was very much reminded and sympathetic for the previous witness because um, if you don't sort of research and um, find out for yourself, you're not going to make much headway and you make decisions um, to do what you feel is right <coughs> for your child, your children. and. Um, you know, it's just staggering, really, that you're not listened to as the child's parents. You know, how could we possibly know what was right educationally for, for our daughter? Uh, and, and, you know, anyway, we persisted and she did go into the mainstream school. She was probably the first child with Down syndrome in the ACT to go through mainstream. But that meant that we had to, um, and we, we chose to um, pay a friend of ours who was at home looking after her four children, who was a teacher, to go into the classroom for three years, uh, about maybe five or six hours a week in total, so that she could, you know, give us the feedback from what was happening in the classroom in a notebook and, um, you know, support Kylie in that way before I think we effectively shamed educational authorities at that point to providing assistance. So that was the impetus to you starting? Yeah, advocacy. I think that all started when we moved to Canberra and realised that there was no similar early intervention there right. uh, that we had been uh, finding was the best way for us to proceed. And Margot, for you? Um, well, Tara's my fourth child. I knew what you'd get away with if you were pushy. <laughs> and bottom line is, um, well, the education department used to tell me, um, oh, the pie's only so big and all of that. And I said, well, I don't really care, make a bigger pie. Yes. Um, she needs services um, and you will give them to her. Um, I, I had lots and lots of fights and arguments with them. Um, I was known as that pushy person. Oh my God, she's on the phone again. I'm sure the... Uh, we should have had a badge made, shouldn't we? Yes. Pushy we, mother. <laughs> um, I'm sure the uh, regional education office <laughs> groaned when they when I told them who I was and I needed to speak to somebody. Um, I also paid for things, um, you know, I think about the speech therapist. Tara went to a speech therapist for uh, 10 years. Um, she learnt lots of social skills. The benefit of her being in mainstream, because life is mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. Interestingly. And um, you have to have skills to survive in mainstream and they're social skills and she needed to learn those. That's And that was my driving force, I suppose. But, you know, my other three kids weren't angels and um, I often had to stand behind them and advocate for them. So, you know, you get a bit of practice and you think you can do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just became automatic. I grew up in a home where, you know, my, my parents were on hospital boards in local government. And I, you just, they were the sort of things that you did. And if you belong to a community, then you put back into the community. So being on the board of um, Down Syndrome New South Wales was just sort of like a, an extension. And if I could change the world for Tara, um, then other people would benefit. And I suppose that's my driving force, that if I can change it, 
just a little bit because my dad taught me that one person can change the world. So what are your, and this is a very convenient segue into the final questions, and I want to ask both of you, uh, from your experience, uh, but also just some of the reflections, and I know that you've both followed some of the evidence, mm. not all of it, but some of the evidence of the last two weeks, and I think some of that has resonated with your experience. Based on your respective experiences, what are the key things that you think the Royal Commission should think about in terms of the changes that you would like to see for your respective daughters and more generally for people with intellectual disability? Margot, I'll start with you and then Evelyn. Well, I think health has got a long way to go till they um, actually understand the needs of people with disability. Um, I'm often... And, and, care, and carers and, and families. families. It's starting there, you know. There is a carers group out there supporting us, a staff in, in um, the health department. But I think the biggest thing that I struggle with is that my colleagues actually often don't realise that their clients or, or patients do actually have an intellectual disability and they need to present <coughs> information differently. And Visual is just the way to go. I mean, I'm a visual learner, so I, I suppose that's my focus. V putting material simply and vis visual pictures for them is just a, a no-brainer. That's how it's got to be. I would love to see the hospitals all have um, a virtual tour. They have it at the children's hospital. So you can go online and have a look at the ward you're going to go to, the theatre you're going to, all those sorts of things for elective surgery. Why don't we have it for everybody else? If you're not health literate or you, English isn't your first language, it would be a huge benefit to know where you're going. Procedures, you know, having blood and ECGs and just everything that you could possibly think of. Um, why can't you just get a little YouTube of it? Um, it would make life so much easier. We were just in, we were told yesterday that New South Wales Health has a range of policies, and one of the guiding principles was person-centred care. What would be an example of person-centred care in a hospital setting? Uh, I've yet to see it. Yeah. Um, person-centred care means that the individual that they and in. Tara's case, it would be Tara, is the centre of the care and everything is explained to her, um, everything's about what would benefit her. Um, it's a great policy. I don't know that it's practical. What would it mean in, pra in practical terms? What would that look like for, for Tara coming to a hospital? Well, visuals, um, the virtual tour, people would stop and listen to her. That she, I'm sure she said it to you when she was here, that she wants to be listened to and heard. Sitting with her in the moment is, yeah, and that, nobody has time for that. Health is chaotic. Um, nobody has the time to sit and listen. And it is the most important thing that you can give anybody, is your time and to listen to them. Um, just practical things have the time to teach her how to care for herself, you know, even having a shower, it's all rush, rush, rush. Um, if they'd said to her before she w went into the shower, because I ended up taking over and explaining, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and then assisting her as needed. I mean, I thought that would be fairly simple, but <coughs> it's not done, because they don't have the time, they, the client load, short-staffed, too many tasks to do in a allocated time. So, yep, person-centred care, great policy. Evelyn, any uh, reflections in terms of things that you think would be matters that might make a difference? Well, <coughs> excuse me, like the previous witness, I was very well reminded of the difficulties I had getting the right sort of... Um, support for Kylie with her mental health issues over many, many years. And um, in the end, she was, you know, medically retired from the public service after suffering yet again through 
lack of real knowledge as to what her needs were and it was a fortunate step in the sense that it gave us time to reflect on how we could get her on a better footing. I mean, I knew I had to get her confidence back. I knew I had to turn her into the person she wanted to be, whatever that meant. Um, and that wasn't easy. Um, she was, you know, very sad, angry. It was a very difficult time. So we knew that in the past she'd sort of done some public speaking and um, did she want to do more of that? Yes. So we set about taking her to NIDA programs and getting her to a speech pathologist who could help develop her speaking skills. And slowly the confidence came back again because she felt she was being the person she wanted to be. It, it was a long haul and it wasn't easy. Um, and then, you know, that met, melded in with the independent living because then her confidence was restored. I just think, you know, the pathways through the mental health process for people with intellectual disability are not very clearly defined by the mental health profession. Um, yes, again, it's a matter of understanding you might be wanting to talk about aspects of behaviour, aspects of thinking, but the concrete suggestions or programs to work on, it's all about getting that confidence back again. Um, and, you know, it can be done. I mean, I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I can do it. The profession should be able to make more of an input into that. Um, and as you saw the other day, Kylie is, you know, uh, quite an extraordinary person uh, and able now to talk about uh, her feelings much more and that gives her the confidence to contribute to the community at large. Uh, I think that's a very good note to end on. Thank you both for uh, sharing your experiences and uh, giving us a window into what, what was behind the evidence given by both Tara and Kylie last week. Um, and so thank you very much. We're very grateful for your evidence today, Commissioners. I, Could I just I'm make I'm one sorry, yes, short, please go ahead. One short statement. Of course. Um, I think our experiences, though we have become very strong advocates, um, have not been necessarily um, supported by family members. Uh, there have been penalties to pay, and that's not always good. But, I mean, looking back, I wouldn't have changed what, what has happened uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it's also important that I say I'm in awe of all that both my daughters have achieved, and I'm very proud of them both. Okay. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you very much both of you for your statements, for giving evidence. I think uh, that uh, it's pretty clear that you've been very powerful advocates. Thank you so much for coming to the Thank you. Commission and contributing and to, to our work. Thanks for the Commission giving us the opportunity to speak. Thank, Thank you. Uh, commissioners, we'll have a very short adjournment just so that we can reconstitute both the bar table and the witness table and if you could give us perhaps three to five minutes and then we'll be with our final witnesses of the hearing. Yes, we'll adjourn for five minutes. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned.
very hard in this area for quite some time, haven't you? Yes. In fact, uh, 34 years ago, you established or you co-founded Self Advocacy Sydney, didn't yes. you? Yes. So 34 years ago, this was something that you and a group of other people like you with the similar goals and experiences came together to address. That's right. Now, can you tell me why was it that you and this other group of people thought that that was a good idea at the time? Uh, because people were listening to um, their peers like child, you know, so I thought we need something to teach people with this intellectual disability to speak up for themselves and advocate on their own behalf. You didn't think it was right, did you, that no. other people would speak for them? No. And what sort of, the sort of work that Self Advocacy Sydney does to this day is that you teach people with an intellectual disability to advocate for themselves. Julie does training with people with intellectual disability and Arthur is the executive officer. And you provide supports to people with intellectual yes. disability on an ongoing basis. We try to get people to do it for themselves. That's the aim. The aim is uh, not do it for them, to show them how to go about it. That's right. But a really important part of that is also about educating the rest of the community, isn't it? Yes. So a big part of the work of Self Advocacy Sydney is educating other people. Yes. You, you give presentations and education sessions to all sorts of bodies, don't you? Yes. Government bodies, businesses, those sorts of Parents things. Parents and people with disability. So the, the whole range yes. you, you address. Yes. It's the case, isn't it, that you um, remain on the board of yes. Self Advocacy Sydney? Yes, I am. And there's seven board members, isn't there? Yes, that's right. And Self Advocacy Sydney, it's not just about saying that it does the right thing for people with intellectual disability. It does that, doesn't it? Yes. So in fact, of those seven board members, five of those people have intellectual disability, don't they? That's correct. Because you would say, they're the best people to lead their organisation. That's right. That's right. It's the case also that there are staff at Self Advocacy Sydney with intellectual disability? Uh, three staff. And they work with people without intellectual disability together? They, they do, but we both. Together in the one office? Yes. It's quite remarkable, um, Robert, that in 2017 and 2018, you attended the United Nations in New York, yes. where you spoke at the Conference of State Parties. Now, this is a long, <laughs> and several words I'm going to put together here, but it's important that people know this. Uh, you spoke at the Conference of State Parties to the Convention of Rights of People with Disabilities, didn't you? Yes. And you spoke specifically about the Easy Read system that we've heard so much about. Yes. I'm just going to show a brief video now of Robert speaking at the United Nations. Okay. It's going to start playing on the screen at any moment. <laughs> we remain confident. So, Robert, you're a bit of an expert in inclusion of people with intellectual disability. What are, what are the main points that you'd like to share? Main point is to help people to speak up for themselves and, and, and encourage people to do things for themselves. So, what are some ways that people can, uh, I guess, teach people to speak up? Um, do easy read. Um, I work with people to. <coughs> to try and show a different way by using pictures and words together. Um, speak, uh, speak to the person when they go to the support person with them. Um, they don't speak to the support person, speak to the person with a disability. People like using big words. I don't like big words. 
straight to the point. <laughs> And Robert, that's something that even in my discussions with you this week, I've reminded myself to not use big words all the time. And thank you no for worries. taking me on that journey. You're welcome. I think it's really exceptional that we've just seen that video, and there I am with my big words. <laughs> I think it's great that we've just seen that video because I suspect, Robert, that you might be the only person in this room who has spoken at the United Nations. All right. And that just goes to show that it doesn't matter what your disability or your, your experiences in life might be, you can do amazing things. And you're certainly an example of that. And that was, um, award, or you, you were awarded an uh, Order of Australia medal yes. in 2017, weren't you? Yes, I was. And you were awarded that for your services to people with disabilities. That's correct. And that's a wonderful achievement. And you're in fact wearing your badge. Yeah today and I said to you that that's the first time I've ever seen one of those badges in real life so thank you for that. You're welcome. I'd like to hand you over now to Justine who's yes. going to just ask you a few questions so we can get another perspective or another understanding of how to communicate with a person with an intellectual disability. Okay. <laughs> Hi Robert. Uh, so we've prepared some questions and answers together um, and we thought this morning um, when we were talking that we might first comment on what it's like to be in this space um, and, um, and how that, um, in, when we're talking about accessibility, it's the physical space as well. Uh -huh. And this space has bright lights and screens and terrifying people. Too many screens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it can be, you use the word uh, daunting. Yes to describe the That's experience. Right. And so we thought we might just say some of, or well, you might just say some of the things that have made it possible for you to, um, to be here and to participate. What's helped? Um, to help me, I, I like working with people. And I like trying to show people that if I can do it, they can do it, you know. Um, some people say people with disability can't do it. And that's a load of rubbish. I'm not sure in today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making certain of that. You said you've been encouraged um, by other advocates yes. in the past. I have an advocate and he helped me mm. get over my problems. And my, because I was kicked off. So that, that, that helped me to work with uh, different people. And this morning um, you spoke with um, one of the lawyers, Simone, yes. um, and you said that the one-to-one -one conversation... It's much better mm -hmm. than having two people at you at all times, you know? Mm. Um, and so preparing um, and listening and watching mm -hmm. what goes on. So we were able to prepare before coming That's today. Right. That's right. Um, and then we were going to talk about um, accessibility, particularly in, in the area of health. Um, Robert, what can make it difficult for people with intellectual disability to communicate with doctors, nurses and other health people? Um, I can't remember what I said. Yeah, no problem. Um, just as well you've done so much work because I have <laughs> our notes to refer to. Um, so some things that you told me was that it depends a lot on how people talk with people. It, it depends if they look at a person they, and if they don't look at you, that's okay. Because they are listening to you, but they are shy. Some people are shy and some people aren't. So we have to work with, with what we get. Mm. And that it's, um, it's helpful for health people to... To understand mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. and listen. Mm -hmm. Listening is good for people. Some people don't listen, then you, can't, you won't get any reaction out of people. And putting, you talked about putting words... And putting words in other people's mouth, like your mouth. And trying to take words out of your mouth. I think that's wrong. I think it's important for us to uh, explain things to us, uh, make certain we're listening 
and watching what's going on, because I watch around the room, and I, and I pick up things mm. a lot faster than anybody else. <laughs> um, and not being rushed. No, not being rushed. It, otherwise, you, it makes it hard for the person to do things. If you rush them, then they might clean up. Yeah. So, so some people might do that, and some people won't do that. What problems have you seen in the way health people work with people with intellectual disability? Um, they are a problem, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the problems I've seen is many different problems in the way of speaking to people uh, and, it, and not, to, not explaining to people what the, the, what's going on. Uh, my daughter has a disability too, so I work with her and I explain to her what's going on and then I get her to, to ask them, if you have a problem, I'm here. I'm always behind her or next to her. Um, you said that sometimes um, people might be frightened to speak up because of past um, experiences. Uh, past experience is a good one to go on because uh, some people might be claim up because they're talking too fast or they're talking uh, not directly at you, they talk over you. And then and that, that makes it hard for the person to understand what you're saying. Um, and one thing that we talked about and that um, we agreed that I might say is that um, a health people, people like doctors and nurses might do well to understand that lots of people with disability who come to see them might have a history of experiencing trauma and so they might not want to talk about that with their health That's person. Right. But, um, but the health person needs to be aware and be sensitive That's right. around that. And also, and their parent or their advocate are with them to make certain they are being listened to, because that's important. If you don't have people listening to you and understanding what you're saying, that's most important for any person with disability. Cause I believe that we can do, try and do it together as one and, and work in a better system. Um, and you've commented that it's good for people to be allowed to talk yes. when they're ready to do that. I agree. Yeah, and not be pushed. No. Nope. Okay. And uh, if they push, they, they clean them up. Because uh, in, uh, like, uh, like you people, you get stubborn. I'm one of those people. <laughs> so uh, it's important for us to realise that we are people first and disability second. Um, and Robert, when we were preparing, um, we've heard a lot at the Royal Commission about hard stories. Yes. Um, and you've commented on some of the things that don't work well. When we were preparing, you also said that you felt you'd often been treated well within the health system. Yes. Um, and so we thought we'd talk about what works well, what you've experienced that has worked well, like being talked to with respect. Uh, being treated as a person, first and foremost, uh, and making certain I understand what they're saying. Is, in, in, is important too, and it's important for, for for people like me can understand thoroughly and carefully. Um, and to be able to ask questions. Yes. And, and ask questions without any backflap, because mm -hmm. that happens to mm -hmm. people with disability. I think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So we try and try and work in the, in the way of that you've got a voice, speak it, show, talk to people. And 
getting your questions answered yes and getting the information you and need and getting it across clearly and concise and you used to volunteer at yes. Westmead Hospital yes I did what did you do there a monetary service it's taking the patient from from admissions to the ward and and any files to the ward. And how did you help people in that role? By talking to them on the way, making them feel at ease. So, because uh, whatever operation they're going for, I, don't, I try and avoid, avoid that and get away from that. So they can feel comfortable being in the hospital. So everyone in the hospital system or in the health system has a role, no matter yes. what they're doing, has a role yes. in helping people feel yes. comfortable at ease and able to ask questions. Yes. Um, what makes um, what yeah? What makes people be included? What helps make people feel included? By asking them, by uh, uh, giving it samples. Um, Showing them what, what needs to be done, um, make certain the person understand what you're trying to say to them. And having a supporter. Sometimes. Oh yes, support person or parent with you to uh, 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 put the question together with you. So it's important for the person to understand that you're. No different than anybody else. That's what I think. And so the supporter can be helpful. Yes. Um, so long as the supporter isn't doesn't become the only person that's talked to. Oh no, the supporter. I get mad when they do that. I say, I I look at them. They they say, oh, my kids used to say, oh, oh dad's getting angry. <laughs> but I look at it. Look at it. Uh, my daughter says, no way, Dad, be cool, <laughs> be calm. <laughs> um, when you went to the UN, you talked about Easy Read. Yes. What are the benefits of Easy Read? Do you want to say what Easy Read is and e what's good about it? Easy Read is easy words put, put pictures together on a page that understand what you're trying to get across. And it's also, it, Easy Read is not plain English. It, it's a picture book where words are in, written in, in, in plain simple words and try and make people understand what they mean. Mm -hmm. And do you just give the document, the Easy Read document to someone and send them away? No. You explain it to them and make certain they understand what that's for. And if they don't want it, that's okay too. And if they, if somebody um, doesn't understand straight away or, or needs some more time, then then we we'll say to them, you can take it away. Then you want to come back, come back. Okay, and what if um, what if an organisation doesn't know how to write in Easy Read? We can get COD or self advocacy to do it and show them. We always bring the people in and show them how to do it. So you can learn yeah. how to to write in Easy yeah. Read. Um, and how do you know that what you you write in the Easy Read is the right information? What can you do about that? You look it on the computer. Yeah, and we do some... Do some research. Research and some testing. Yes. Make, make, make certain... Uh, we show people that anybody can do easy read if you have the patient the chance to, and to put it across. Um, what else can help with communication? What else is good? Signing. Signing? Yeah. I do signing too. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I know you know they're signing, so I'm trying not to do it. It makes it harder sometimes. Um, and it, communication is if you talk to the person directly and ask questions, 
They, they might look at you, they might not. That's okay. I always look at the um, look at uh, the person as a person first, and disability second. I always done that. Always, uh, I say, you might have a disability. Let's work together on whatever you want. And that's what we do. We do it in self help as CID. And if people don't know how to communicate with people with intellectual disability... Then we teach them. So you can do training. You yes. can learn. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of training. We support people and they are surprised what training I can do. And people, people, can, people with disability can train many different ways by talking, by role playing and by showing pictures and putting words together in an easy way. So people with intellectual disability can do the training, yes. can lead the training, yes. create the training? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, we do it at self advocacy. There's a proof there. And finally, um, what about when policies are being made? Is it important to work with people with intellectual disability to make sure you get the policy right? And understanding. It's not easy to read the policies. I get them and chuck them in the bin. Uh, I knew somebody would ask. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think policy is too wordy sometimes. They need to be put in easy read. For, you know, we need policy to make certain the organisation runs well, or, or the government runs well. Yeah. It's and important for that to happen. And to write a good policy yes. about something that affects people with intellectual disability, which is most things, yes. then you need to talk with Talk people. to a person with a disability or people with a disability to able to make certain it's easy read. Easy read and that what's in it is and a good policy yes. too. Yeah. Um, I think that is all the questions that we have Good. prepared. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Robert and Justine, um, for being our final witnesses here for the health hearing in Sydney. Robert, there were so many important things that you've just told us about, but I think if we take away one message from what you've just said, um, for us all to reflect on at the conclusion of what feels like a um, long but very interesting hearing. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is that we all, in your words, see a person with a disability as a person first mm -hmm. and their disability second. That's right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Robert, thank you very much for coming and talking with us. No worries. And uh, yes, we agree. That's the thing that should be taken away from your evidence first and foremost. Thank okay. you, and thank you, Justine, for your contributions in talking with Robert and also for all of the, the assistance you've given during the course of this hearing. Thank you very much. We appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, commissioners, we have completed the evidence for this aspect of the public hearing, and, Chair, I know that you wish to make some closing remarks. We also have some administrative matters that we need to deal with, and we thought if it was convenient just to have a short adjournment rather than take the full lunchtime break now. So if we have an adjournment, if it, I don't know how long the chair needs, but maybe 10 minutes. To do what? So that um, we, I can make sure that I've got all of the detail that I need to convey in relation to the tendering of any right. final exhibits. You, you, you want to attend I need, to, I need to, uh, So I want to attend to that. I want to make sure that um, we've confirmed with the parties if there's any issues arising from the tender of material. And then I know you wish to make some closing remarks. So if we had, want, Are you going to make some closing remarks? I'm not going to make any particular closing remarks. Right. Um, I think people have heard enough from me during the course of the two weeks. But, uh, but we do have some directions that you're going to make in relation to what will happen after this hearing. So I just need a few minutes yeah. to make All sure right. that's we'll, in we'll order. Take, we'll take uh, 10 minutes or so and uh, then... Uh, I'll deal with any closing remarks and uh, any orders or directions that need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Robert. You're welcome. The Royal Commission is adjourned.
The Royal Commission is resumed. Yeah. I'm very uh, impressed that a number of people have stayed in the room. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Ms Eastman, yeah. Uh, can I just deal with the balance of the evidence? So I would like to formally tender into evidence the remainder of the documents that we have been using or referring during the course of the hearing. And some of these are documents that are annexures to the witness statements. And the commissioners will recall there have been references to part D and part E of the tender bundle. So if the documents in part D of the tender bundle, which is tabs one through to 192, uh, and a final index of these documents was circulated yesterday evening for any comments by the parties with leave to appear. Uh, there are no comments or objections to that material being received into evidence. Could they be marked as a group? Exhibits 4.41 through to exhibit 4.229 and we have a detailed index which will accompany that. Yes, that can be done, thank you. Then with the documents that are in part D of the tender bundle, sorry, part, part E D. of yeah. the tender bundle, uh, and these are tabs one through to tabs 229, and again, a final index of the part E documents were circulated yesterday for comment by the parties with leave to appear if they could be received into evidence and marked exhibits 4.230 through to exhibit 4.451. 451, yes. That completes the tender of the uh, documentary material. And uh, I, on this occasion, don't wish to make any closing remarks other than to uh, thank everyone for their assistance. That includes the witnesses, their lawyers uh, and their support people and also to thank the team that puts together a hearing for the Royal Commission. It's too vast to name and identify everybody but suffice to say they have been an extraordinarily great team this week in getting, or in the last two weeks, to getting the hearing up and running and to getting us to the close of the proceedings today. Thank you, Commissioners. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms Eastman. I should ask, um, Ms Furness, is there anything that you wish to say or add at this stage? Uh, only, uh, Commissioner, that as I understand it, the email my friend refers to was received at, at 7.20 by my <coughs> So which email are we talking about? The email setting out the indexes. Yes. And uh, for some reason, the text didn't download. And so there were the two, I think, indexes annexed without any text. I think it's now downloaded, but it wasn't at the time. And so while we have no objection, uh, I would like to be able to check that the documents that are included cover all of the documents that we have provided. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, well, you'll have that opportunity. If there is any difficulty, please, if you would uh, communicate directly with uh, Ms Eastman or if that's not convenient with the <coughs> Office of Solicitor Assisting, and if there's any issue, it can be resolved at that stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, is there anything, anybody else who would like to...? <laughs> no, thank you, Chair. No? All right. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Ms Eastman, um, the directions that I've been asked to make, uh, may we take it that there's no objection to those? Uh, I've only very briefly raised those directions with the parties who uh, legal representatives are behind me, but I understand these are the directions that you propose to make. It's what I propose to make. Our question was whether there's any difficulty in making them, not that as far as you're aware. No. All right, well, if there is any such difficulty, uh, then council uh, appearing for the parties can raise it. Uh, the first matter is that by the 13th of March 2020, any witness who took questions on notice during this hearing should provide his or her answers in writing to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission. We would be assisted if those answers could be targeted and concise and uh, not address uh, additional or unnecessary matters. In addition, in the lead up to this hearing, the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission sent a number of letters to individuals and institutions uh, for reasons of procedural fairness. 
Therefore, by the 13th of March 2020, those individuals or institutions should provide any submissions they wish to make in response and uh, together with any other material that uh, they wish to put to the Commission. Any uh, reason should be given for the provision of any additional material and all correspondence relating to these matters should be directed to the Office of the Solicitor assisting the Royal Commission. Next, Council assisting the Royal Commission will consider any additional material and determine if any further steps need to be taken. And by the 20th of March 2020, Council assisting will tender whatever additional material she considers uh, appropriate. Council assisting the Royal Commission will then prepare a document setting out a brief outline of the evidence during the hearing, a number of the key themes that have emerged from the evidence, and some of the possible recommendations that the Royal Commission may wish to make or further lines of inquiry that may be pursued. By the 17th of April, uh, this document will be made available on a confidential basis to the parties who have leave to appear at the hearing, to the witnesses who gave evidence, and to any institutions or entities that received a procedural fairness letter from the Office of Solicitor Assisting. Anyone who wishes to make submissions in response to that document should do so by the 8th of May 2020. Those submissions in response, again, should be concise and should not include any additional proposed evidence. Following consideration of the document prepared by Council Assisting, along with any submissions received in response to that document, the Royal Commission will prepare a short report on this hearing and that report will be made public in due course. <clears throat> uh, these nine days of hearing in Homebush have been very significant. During the hearing, as you know, the Royal Commission has investigated the provision of health care and health services for people with cognitive disability. On the first morning of this hearing, uh, Tuesday last week, and it does seem a long time ago, I said that the consequences of neglect and abuse by or within the health system for people with cognitive disability are as disturbing as they are profound. I also said that the extent and consequences of neglect and abuse should shock the conscience of all Australians. We have heard a great deal of evidence that amply bears out that assessment. In some ways it has been a very difficult experience for everybody who has either been in this room or followed the proceedings. The evidence has frequently been distressing and sometimes even heartbreaking. But it is essential that the Royal Commission, as its terms of reference require, exposes neglect and abuse in all settings, including the health system. Important and compelling evidence has been given over these nine days of hearing by people with cognitive disability and by the parents or family of people with cognitive disability. We are extremely grateful to all of them. We are especially grateful to Ms Kylie Scott, Mr Jack Kelly, Mr Ruth Oslington, Ms Tara Elliff, and Mr Robert Strike AM from whom we heard today. We hope that uh, you have derived satisfaction from sharing your experiences with the Royal Commission. <coughs> Professor Troller, from whom we heard recently, and other dedicated researchers have done groundbreaking work which demonstrates the depth of the chasm between the life expectancy of people with cognitive disability and that of the population at large, as well as revealing the extent to which people with cognitive disability experience other serious health conditions, that is, comorbidity. The expert evidence from Professor Troller, <coughs> Dr Small and Professor Lennox is critical to appreciating the extent and consequences of neglect and abuse of people with cognitive disability within the health system. But the human impact of that neglect and abuse can only be fully understood through the direct lived experience of people with cognitive disability and their family members. The witnesses who have been generous and determined enough to give evidence at this hearing have not only recounted their often deeply traumatic experiences, but have explained what we need to do in this country to transform an unacceptable state of affairs. That is, to achieve practical realisation 
of the right recognised by Article 25 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. This hearing has also demonstrated the crucial role that can be played by disability advocacy organisations and individual advocates at both the systemic and individual level. The evidence from the representatives of the Commonwealth and the State of New South Wales, from whom we heard yesterday, demonstrates the significance of the work of the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability and ad other advocacy organisations which seek to advance the well-being of people with cognitive disability. The evidence from Ms Mills about the value of microboards is an illustration of the innovative ideas that can be generated by individual advocates. The form and content of this hearing owe a great deal to the contributions of the CID, in particular uh, to uh, <coughs> Robert Strike, Mr Jack Kelly, Mr Jim Smithson and Ms Justine O'Neill who uh, was uh, uh, in the uh, witness box today or the notional witness box in any event. The novel way in which this hearing room has been set up is a result of suggestions from the council. I hope I can be forgiven for referring to something with a legal flavour. Oliver Wendell Holmes, a famous judge of the Supreme Court of the United States, once said that lawyers tend to regard the common law as a brooding omnipresence in the sky. These words can perhaps be adapted to describe the CID as a brooding omnipresence in the halls of government and policy making. The CID's endeavours and those of advo other advocates for people with cognitive disability have already achieved significant gains, but I suspect that their most successful days are yet to come, perhaps in the not too distant future. The terms of reference for the Commission require us to take account of previous inquiries, of which there have been a great number. The evidence over the past two weeks shows that the path to genuine reform has often been mapped out pretty clearly. What is needed is a stimulus to governments to move much more rapidly upon the path of reform so as to bring about the changes that are needed to give full effect to the rights of people with cognitive disability. It's part of the role of this Royal Commission to provide that stimulus. It's also very much part of the Commission's responsibility to inform the Australian community of the nature and extent of violence against, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. That responsibility extends to attempting to transform public attitudes towards the experiences of people with disability, including of course people with cognitive disability with whom we have been principally concerned these past two weeks. We have heard graphic evidence of the consequences, sometimes catastrophic, of lack of understanding and entrenched bias in the delivery of health services. The impetus for reforms will be very much driven by a recognition within the Australian community that a grave injustice has been inflicted on a very large number of vulnerable people. It is self-evident that the media have a key part to play in informing the community and thereby changing attitudes. This can be done, among other ways, by accurately and fairly reporting the evidence at public hearings and the proposals for change that have been put forward. It's not the role of the Commission to tell the media what to report. However, we do wish to commend the reporting by significant sections of the mainstream media of this hearing. In particular, the ABC, as befits, as befits a national broadcaster, has fully reported the proceedings and given prominence to the issues that have been explored. SBS and other free-to-air channels have also given prominence to the issues uh, which prior to the com this Commission commencing its work have received relatively little coverage. Guardian Australia is another that has, all, has provided coverage of the hearing. Finally, I wish to thank all those who have been involved in preparing for and conducting this hearing. It is an extraordinarily difficult and complex task involving all sections of the Commission. The hearing would not have been possible without the dedication and commitment of the staff of the Royal Commission. They have done outstanding work under the usual extreme pressures of time and resources, which will not diminish over the life of the Commission. That the hearing has run so smoothly 
is a tribute to all people who can be seen around the precincts of this hearing room and many others who work behind the scenes. I want to express particular thanks to the senior counsel assisting the Royal Commission, Ms. East, Ms. Case Eastman SC, and to junior counsel assisting the Royal Commission, Ms. Simone Fraser and Ms. Georgina Wright. They, together with the Office of Solicitor Assisting, have worked prodigiously and with the utmost professionalism to give voice to people with cognitive disability in this hearing. Uh, the Commission will now adjourn and we will resume uh, when we have our next public hearing, which will be dealing further with the issue of education. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is adjourned.